It's almost 1 p.m. in Sydney and 11 a.m. in Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Paul Allen. Here are the top stories. Asian stocks advancing with dovish Fed minutes and a downsizing of U.S. payrolls, reinforcing bets on a September rate cut. The yen firmer ahead of BOJ Governor Ueda's Friday grilling in Parliament. Xiaomi shares surging in Hong Kong as second quarter earnings top estimates. We'll hear exclusively from the CFO about their foray into a crowded EV field. Plus, Kamala Harris's running mate Tim Walt set to address the Democratic Convention shortly. We are live in Chicago. And here are live pictures of the Democratic National Convention. Day three, once again, been hearing from a who's who of the Democratic Party. Right now, hearing from Pete Buttigieg, one of the new generation of Democratic leaders. We've also heard from Wes Moore. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. Shapiro and Buttigieg, obviously, both uh, close calls to be the vice presidential running mate pick for Kamala Harris. But eventually, it was Tim Walls that got the nod, and uh, he's the man of the moment. That's the keynote event that we're building up to tonight. Uh, let's bring in Bloomberg Balance of Power co anchor Joe Matthew. He's at the DNC in Chicago. So, Joe, waiting to hear from Tim Walls, uh, what message are we expecting to get tonight? Well, it's going to be a get to know you for starters. Four in 10 Americans tell the Associated Press in a new poll they don't even know enough about Tim Walls to form an opinion about Kamala Harris's running mate. So they see this as kind of a fresh start here after a couple of weeks have gone by since Kamala Harris has named him as a running mate and he's endured some criticism from the Trump campaign, namely about his military service, accusations of stolen valor, abandoning his troops, lying about serving in combat. These are some of the accusations that he will likely try to answer this evening as he tries to get to know the crowd in the room here and also reach out to people in their living rooms who've never heard of the governor of Minnesota, a coach turned teacher, turned congressman, longtime member of the Army National Guard, and of course now the governor of a pretty important state here on the road to the White House. He's going to make the case, obviously, for his own self. He's going to spend time attacking Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, who he likes to call weird, and will likely get this crowd on its feet. He's had some major turnouts for rallies with Kamala Harris over the past couple of weeks, including last evening when they were in Milwaukee in the swing state of Wisconsin. So I would expect to see him rev up this crowd, and they are already there. As you mentioned, we've heard from the rising stars tonight. We also heard from Bill Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, and others. We're getting our way closer to the, the culmination of this convention tomorrow night when Kamala Harris accepts the nomination. And this tonight will be a big step along the way. Well, at least that he's kind of pulled ahead in popularity versus his Republican counterpart, J.D. Vance. What does he need to do to kind of establish himself and tout some of the progressive policy wins while he was Minnesota governor? Well, it's interesting you say that because I don't know that we're going to hear a Tim Walls espousing a progressive political philosophy. I think it's going to be more of an attempt to go to the middle of the road here. He's got a very supportive and happy crowd. Doesn't have to prove his progressive credentials necessarily to the people in the room, but this is a campaign that's trying to draw independence. A very narrow slice of voters in states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin who may not react terribly well to some of the more progressive ideas that the governor has espoused in Minnesota. He's going to be talking more to rural Americans, rural sensibilities, common sense, as he likes to say, and in fact prove that he's not what the Trump campaign likes to accuse him of being just another dangerous liberal. Um, Joe, you mentioned earlier we did hear from Bill Clinton, who joked that uh, he is, in fact, still younger than Donald Trump. So uh, that's one of the uh, attack yeah. lines that the Democrats seem to be running here. What else do they need to persuade uh, to do to persuade some of those Republicans who, who might be thinking twice or some of those swing voters? Well, look, that's what's going to be the job following tonight and tomorrow when the party gets itself together after circling the wagons here. And that's going to start a road show you typically see after conventions. Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, who have had much less time together, obviously, than Donald Trump has had in this campaign, will take the show on the road. They're going to be in swing states, not just the Rust Belt, but also the Sun Belt states here in America, from North Carolina all the way through Georgia on to Arizona. They're trying to expand the map, though. They want us to look at states like Florida, for instance, that have not recently been in play uh, for Democrats. So. 
they're taking a slightly different approach here, and you're going to see Donald Trump and J.D. Vance back on the road a lot, too. They've been counter-programming this Democratic National Convention every day this week. They did so again today with another rally that focused on issues like crime that they're trying to hang around the necks of Democrats. You're going to hear Tim Walls talk about that tonight, and Kamala Harris will do the same again tomorrow. We've also seen, I mean, to your point about counter-programming, Trump has kind of cried foul about the personal attacks from some of the stars at the Democrats at the DMC uh, this week, from the Obamas, from Clinton as well. What is your sense of, you know, the extent in which he's going to be able to counter these uh, counterattacks? Well, it's unclear. Uh, look, this is a campaign in the, in the Donald Trump, J.D. Vance camp that came out of Milwaukee with a lot of momentum after their Republican National Convention and the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Things have changed a lot. They're still trying to coalesce around a message. Donald Trump has been trying out different nicknames and attack lines, none of which have really seemed uh, to have stuck here, and I would expect to see a lot more effort in that sense. You also might see a more disciplined Donald Trump, at least that's what his campaign likes to think. He has been hewing a bit more closely to the message and the teleprompter recently, but he frequently cannot do this without personally insulting his opponent. And that's something that they've been highlighting here at this convention. Barack Obama called him childish last night. Tonight, Bill Clinton said it's about we the people versus me, myself, and I. All right, balance of power co anchor Joe Matthew there at the DNC in Chicago. And stay tuned for our live special coverage from the final nights of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Vice President Kamala Harris will be formally accepting the nomination as the Democratic candidate for president. Now, that is at the times that you can see on the screen there. All right, let's take a look at how markets are tracking right now. Avril, what are you watching? Well, we're watching the handover from Wall Street, aren't we? As we saw a bit of a pickup, it's really about how markets are running ahead with the idea that we're going to get those Fed rate cuts. It is a bit aggressive in terms of pricing in the markets. Uh, and indeed, we saw this confirmation of sorts after the dovish Fed minutes, as well as that potential downward revision in the jobs. And preliminary data suggests that, you know, the jobs market wasn't as strong as previously thought and put all this together you got a lot of that being already priced in in the treasuries market today it looks like stocks started the day on the front foot but they've kind of pulled under now of course today we also got the bok decision and to some it sounded a bit more hawkish particularly from what we got from the governor let's bring in uh, for more on markets in general with sanjay guglani who manages more than one billion dollars as founder and cio of silverdale bond funds so, Sanjay, let's start off with what we've got from the U.S. first. I mean, in terms of how much the markets already have priced in, there's a lot of chance of disappointment. When you look at the cracks in the labor market, for example, how bad does it really look? So two aspects of the question you put across. First is how much has been market priced in? The answer is market has been consistently overpricing the number of credit cuts which will happen. And therefore, at Silverdale, we've been very cautious in terms of counting on the rate cuts for the performance. Coming to labor market, the interesting portion is that this is an annual recalibration of the BLS, uh, which happens based on the QCEW, which is quarterly census of employment and wages. So this, this was very much on the expected lines. Even after adjusting for this uh, recalibration of BLS data, uh, at 160,000 odd, I think labor market is reasonably strong. I don't want to say it, we are pointing to a recession per se. So what are you seeing in terms of what we get from Jay Powell potentially tomorrow as he'll have to, you know, as some of our strategists have put it, thread the needle? Does this latest data coming out actually make it more complicated for him in terms of pushing back against market expectations? Uh, I think uh, if I to give one credit to the chairman, Powell, is the fact that he's been able to manage the market very, very well. As you reflect in the early this year, even from November 2023 onwards, when the market was talking about six, seven rate cuts, he brought down back to three. So I think he's done an incredibly good job. So if you look in terms of the FOMC minutes, which have come last night, uh, the, the, the tone of the minutes was a little more dovish than what the chairman was talking about it. So from that point of view, I think he will be have a sufficient rope to be able to 
uh, nudge the market in the right path. Already in terms of rate cuts, uh, market is talking about two plus rate cuts you know, <laughs> with the, what happened in, in Japan. It's already coming to about one rate cut uh, to two rate cuts in terms of, of, of September. I think one looks to be most likely in September uh, coming out. Yes, uh, and to September, how big is the cut we're going to get? Because we've got markets pricing in about 100 basis points of cuts, which suggests, well, one of the three remaining this year might be supersized. But it's a good time to put the question of the day to you. Uh, which assets are going to be most at risk if the Fed rate cut is on the small side? So uh, from the uh, Silverdale point of view, of course, we are rightly positioned, I would say, because we are at the lower end of the curve. But yes, people, those who have been poised the portfolio uh, for larger rate cuts, they will be impacted, the large duration uh, funds sector. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the, in terms of equity market, uh, which is that if equity market was expecting a faster rate cut to assist the company's earning growth, that's not going to come any day too soon. Well, one suspects we've got a lot of other central banks around the world, particularly here in Asia, just waiting and seeing uh, what the Fed does. Because, of course, we've had the Bank of Korea, Indonesia, Thailand all on hold. Looks like the Reserve Bank of India is in no hurry either. Uh, which Asian central bank do you think is going to be the first one to move? Uh, see, the, the, the key thing to keep in mind is two very important uh, underlying factors. The first and foremost is in terms of emerging markets, especially Asian emerging markets. Uh, the central banks have been very cautious. They were the first to move after the COVID in terms of, for example, to defend the currency sector out there. But thereafter, they've been very, very careful. Now, given the, the favorable demographic and growth, the central uh, banks have the choice and the ability to withhold cutting rate too fast. And they need not also cut too harsh because of the fact that the actual rate hike they did was very limited. To give an illustration, so in case of India, for example, uh, the rate hike was from about 4% pre-pandemic to about 6.5%, right? Versus the US, which went from all the way from 0 to 5.5%. So uh, in terms of the uh, ability to withstand in terms of the, uh, the, the rate cuts, they can still wait for the US to react act before they can react out there. And therefore, we do not see any rush by the Asian uh, central bankers in terms of rate cuts. So shallower cuts from Asia central yeah, banks. Yeah, yeah. What about geopolitical risks? I mean, you know, we're in the thick of, you know, looking out to the US election. The DNC is underway. Whether it's a Republican or Democrat presidency, it's likely to retain this hardline stance on China. What is that going to mean for the rest of Asia? Uh, so, so from the investor point of view, uh, they have some long-term implications. Right? In the short term, we know this is a classic uh, play which happens whenever there is a change in regime which is undergoing, so that's, that's very normal to happen. So from the long-term point of view, we were seeing more polarized world. Uh, we would see more uh, trade happening between the countries in non-dollar denominated uh, portion. Uh, we already seen certain leads uh, done by various Asian countries. Uh, the, in terms of the geopolitics, look at the geopolitics from two different aspects of it. A, in terms of real politics, politics, like in terms of wars, the sector out there, uh, they will be contained, they will be prolonged, it, it has to be uh, negotiated, the sector out there, and of course, if they change in, in, uh, in, the, in the party in the US, it will become slightly more difficult, but that's the nature of the beast. But from the investor point of view, from the short term point of view, we do not expect the tariffs to be lowered. Tariffs will go on increasing us out there, uh, specifically because there's a race in terms of, for example, AIs and the new technologies sector which are coming into play. So from the short-term point of view, tariffs not coming down. From long-term point of view, of course, there will be no new core competencies coming into various regions. And from the investor point of view, it is brilliant. It's brilliant because it means high dispersion. High dispersion basically means that for active investors, we have more chance of making alpha. You say tariffs not going to come down. That's going to have knock-on effects on growth. How do you look at, say, Asia high yield as a whole then in this environment? So as I mentioned to you, because tariffs are not going to come down, means there will be realignment in terms of how the industries will form, uh, which basically means you will have huge amount of, of opportunities for, for the regional firms to become bigger and better. Right? So it will not be a, a dominance by one or a, even with a duopoly. It will become a maybe quasi-oligopoly or even a better standard sector out there. 
So the, from the Asian high yield point of view, you will always get huge amount of uh, opportunities, whether it is in terms of the, the Quasi secular play like in Macau Gaming, you know, where we see consistent increase in vegetation. But look in terms of, for example, revenue growth, not as good, showing the change in the in in the vegetations, or in terms of the restricted groups of renewables in India. So these are all plays which will come into into being, and there are the opportunities which were uh, earlier not really, uh, you know, material. Now they are becoming more and more significant. On India, we heard earlier this month the RBI sounded a bit more hawkish, and that might drag on for a bit more. Do you think that affects the debt market boom we're seeing? Um, okay, so let me uh, put this down. See, the people were trying to you know, overshoot the gun, I would say, in terms of the inflation data. The inflation data was down absolutely yes, from almost 5 plus percent to 3.5 or percent, primarily led by the vegetables and food. But that is basically a seasonal and uh, uh, tactical point of view. So I don't think uh, we are seeing a, a surprise or significant move by RBI on that account. And as I mentioned earlier, it's also because uh, India is in a nice position in terms of the, of the uh, global movement in, of the flow coming to India with the inclusion of India into indices out there. So long uh, story short, basically, think the point is that from the, uh, I would say, stars are aligned in favor of India, that we are seeing the right flow. We have also seen uh, the uh, uptick in the private sector uh, capex, which is the first thing we, have, we are seeing after almost 2022. That again, we are seeing a pickup in a private investment, which is brilliant for India. So from all overall point of view, we have already seen the number of issues, uh, the bond issuance from India rising mm -hmm. this year. Uh, we had more issues this year than the entire, entire uh, okay. full last year. And of course, we should see more issues coming and quality issues where the credit is improving. Right. And of course, we have a great benefit of a growth uh, uh, supporting like it. Sounds like a lot of tailwinds for Absolutely. India. Absolutely. Sanjay, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights and strategy with us. Sanjay Guglani, founder and CIO of Silver Dale Bond Funds. Paul? All right, still to come, we're going to have some more on the Bank of Korea's dovish guidance, raising the possibility of a pivot in October. We're going to be live in Seoul up next. And, of course, we are watching events from the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. We have live pictures for you there. Uh, we are hearing from Amy Klobuchar at the moment, the senator from Minnesota. Looks like she's just wrapped up, actually. We're going to be hearing from football player Ben Ingman next as we build up to the main event of the evening, Hearing from vice presidential candidate Tim Walz. We'll bring that speech to you when it happens. This is Bloomberg. You know, all this got me thinking about the kinds of leaders we need. We want the people in charge. All right, let's get over to the Asia Trade co-anchor Sherry Ahn in Seoul. Sherry has been watching uh, the Bank of Korea decision. Of course, uh, no change, 13 meetings in a row now. We're at 3.5%. Some concerns there over rising house prices. Uh, what else did the BOK consider? Yeah, we're watching very closely if it was a unanimous decision. It was. It was another unanimous decision. But the decision might get trickier going forward. This is according to Governor Yi tang -yong that just finished his press conference. Now talking about how deliberations will likely get harder in October, we got that indication of a dovish tilt by the fact that the statement authorities removed a previous pledge to keep rates steady for a sufficient period of time. So what happens next then is the question, right? Well, we got more indications by the fact that four out of six board members are now open to a rate cut. That's an increase from two board members in the previous month. Now, Governor Lee saying the rate cut conditions have been created when they look just at the CPI alone. They have downgraded CPI expectations for 2024 to 2.5%. However, 
he always puts the caveat there that the door is open forward guidance doesn't guarantee a rate cut that it will all depend on economic data going forward when it comes to the timing between October and November for that rate cut of course the reason is the risk around volatility whether it's in the property market as you alluded to or just the financial markets as well the Bank of Korea has been trying to stem rising trends in home prices according to Governor Yi who also talked about the heater rise in home prices being unfavorable to the Korean economy. Yeah, that's a good point because it sounds like despite that downward revision to or the downward forecast on growth, on inflation, they want to leave some optionality as far as housing prices might pose a risk to the market. But this household debt issue is one that has always been an issue for the BOK. Perhaps what, what makes things different this time around, Sherry? Households in South Korea are one of the most leveraged in the developed world. We're talking about debt to GDP ratios among the highest, topping 100%. Now, we have seen that credit data improving in the second quarter. However, when it comes to mortgage related leveraging, that's continued to add up and pressure the economy, pressure policymakers. When it comes to growth, yes, there is a little bit of concern about consumption going forward, but Governor Yi Chang Yong saying that consumption. Uh, trends are not as unfavorable at the moment. We have seen retail sales contracting for the past four months, which has led to more uh, speculation that mm -hmm. the next move by the BOK will be a rate cut. However, Sherry. when it comes to the broader economy of Sherry. South Korea, we have seen very strong export growth. Paul. All right, uh, Sherry on there in Seoul, Asia Trade Co. Anchor, sorry I had to cut you off there, Sherry, because there he is, Tim Walls, taking the stage at the Democratic National Convention. Let's listen in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, to Vice President Harris. Thanks for putting your trust in me and for inviting me to be part of this incredible campaign. And a thank you to President Joe Biden for four years of strong, historic leadership. It's, it's the honor of my life to accept your nomination for Vice President of the United States. We're all, we're all here tonight for one beautiful, simple reason. We love this country. So thank you to all of you here in Chicago and all of you watching at home tonight. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your determination. And most of all, thank you for bringing the joy to this fight. Now, I grew up in Butte, Nebraska, a town of 400 people. I had 24 kids in my high school class, and none of them went to Yale. But I'll tell you what, growing up in a small town like that, you learn how to take care of each other. That, that family down the road, they may not think like you do. They may not pray like you do. They may not love like you do. But they're your neighbors. And you look out for them. And they look out for you. Everybody belongs and everybody has a responsibility to contribute. For me, it was serving in the Army National Guard. I joined up two days after my 17th birthday, and I proudly wore our nation's uniform for 24 years. 
My dad, a Korean War era Army veteran, died of lung cancer a couple years later. He left behind a mountain of medical debt. Thank God for Social Security survivor benefits. And thank God for the GI Bill that allowed my dad and me to go to college and millions of other Americans. Eventually, like the rest of my family, I fell in love with teaching. Three, three out of four of us married teachers. I wound up teaching social studies and coaching football at Mankato West High School. Go Scarlets! We ran, we ran a 44 defense. We played through to the whistle on every single play, and we even won a state championship. Never closed the yearbook, people. But it was those players and my students who inspired me to run for Congress. They saw in me what I had hoped to instill in them, a commitment to the common good, an understanding that we're all in this together, and the belief that a single person can make a real difference for their neighbors. So there I was, a 40-something high school teacher with little kids, zero political experience, and no money running in a deep red district. But you know what? Never underestimate a public school teacher. Never. I represented my neighbors in Congress for 12 years, and I learned an awful lot. I learned how to work across the aisle on issues like growing the rural economies and taking care of veterans. And I learned how to compromise without compromising my values. Then I came back to serve as governor, and we got right to work making a difference in our neighbors' lives. We cut taxes for the middle class. We passed paid family and medical leave. We invested in fighting crime and affordable housing. We cut the cost of prescription drugs and helped people escape the kind of medical debt that nearly sank my family. And we made sure that every kid in our state gets breakfast and lunch every day. So while other states were banning books from their schools, we were banishing hunger from ours. We also protected reproductive freedom, because in Minnesota, we respect our neighbors and the personal choices they make. And even if we wouldn't make those same choices for ourselves, we've got a golden rule. Mind your own damn business. And that includes IVF and fertility treatments. And this is personal for Gwen and I. If you've never experienced the hell that is infertility, I guarantee you, you know somebody who has. And I can remember praying each night for a phone call. The pit in your stomach when the phone had rang, and the absolute agony when we heard the treatments hadn't worked. It took Gwen and I years, but we had access to fertility treatments. And when our daughter was born, we named her Hope. Hope, Gus, and Gwen, you are my entire world, and I love you. I'm letting you in on how we started a family, because this is a big part about what this election is about. Freedom. When, Re when Republicans use the word freedom, 
They mean that the government should be free to invade your doctor's office. Corporations, free to pollute your air and water. And banks, free to take advantage of customers. But when we Democrats talk about freedom, we mean the freedom to make a better life for yourself and the people that you love. Freedom to make your own health care decisions. And yeah, your kids' freedom to go to school without worrying about being shot dead in the hall. Look, I know guns. I'm a veteran. I'm a hunter. And I was a better shot than most Republicans in Congress, and I got the trophies to prove it. But I'm also a dad. I believe in the Second Amendment, but I also believe our first responsibility is to keep our kids safe. That's what this is all about. The responsibility we have to our kids, to each other, and to the future that we're building together, in which everyone is free to build the kind of life they want. But not everyone has that same sense of responsibility. Some folks just don't understand what it takes to be a good neighbor. Take Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Their Project 2025 will make things much, much harder for people who are just trying to live their lives. They spent a lot of time pretending they know nothing about this. But look, I coached high school football long enough to know and trust me on this. When somebody takes the time to draw up a playbook, they're going to use it. And, and we know if these guys get back in the White House, they'll start jacking up the costs on the middle class, they'll repeal the Affordable Care Act, they'll gut Social Security and Medicare, and they will ban abortion across this country with or without Congress. Here's the thing. It's an agenda nobody asked for. It's an agenda that serves nobody except the richest and the most extreme amongst us. And it's an agenda that does nothing for our neighbors in need. Is it weird? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's also wrong. And it's dangerous. It's not just me saying so. It's Trump's own people. They were with him for four years. They're warning us that the next four years will be much, much worse. You know, when I was teaching every year, we'd elect a student body president. And you know what? Those teenagers could teach Donald Trump a hell of a lot about what a leader is. <laughs> Leaders don't spend all day insulting people and blaming others. Leaders do the work. So I don't know about you, I'm ready to turn the page on these guys. So go ahead. Say it with me. We're not going back. We've got something better to offer the American people. It starts with our candidate, Kamala Harris. From her first day as a prosecutor, as a district attorney, as an attorney general, as a United States senator, and then our vice president, she's fought on the side of the American people. She's taken on the predators and fraudsters. She's taken down the transnational gangs, and she stood up to powerful corporate interest. She has never hesitated to reach across that aisle if it meant improving your lives. And she's always done it with energy, with passion, and with joy. Folks, we've got a chance to make Kamala Harris the next President of the United States. But I think we owe it to the American people to tell them exactly what she'd do as President before we ask them for their votes. 
So here, this is the part, clip and save it and send it to your undecided relatives so they know. <laughs> if you're a middle class family or a family trying to get into the middle class, Kamala Harris is gonna cut your taxes. If you're getting squeezed by prescription drug prices, Kamala Harris is gonna take on Big Pharma. If you're hoping to buy a home, Kamala Harris is gonna help make it more affordable. And no matter who you are, Kamala Harris is gonna stand up and fight for your freedom to live the life that you want to lead. Because that's what we want for ourselves and it's what we want for our neighbors. You know, you might not know it, but I haven't given a lot of big speeches like this. <laughs> but I have given a lot of pep talks. <laughs> so let me, let me finish with this, team. It's the fourth quarter. We're down a field goal, but we're on offense and we've got the ball. We're driving down the field. And boy, do we have the right team. Kamala Harris is tough. Kamala Harris is experienced, and Kamala Harris is ready. Our job, our job, our job, our job for everyone watching is to get in the trenches and do the blocking and tackling. One inch at a time, one yard at a time, one phone call at a time, one door knock at a time, one $5 donation at a time. Look, we got 76 days. That's nothing. There'll be time to sleep when you're dead. We're going to leave it on the field. That's how we'll keep moving forward. That's how we'll turn the page on Donald Trump. That's how we'll build a country where workers come first. Health care and housing are human rights. And the government stays the hell out of your bedroom. That's how we make America a place where no child is left hungry, where no community is left behind, where nobody gets told they don't belong. That's how we're going to fight. And as the next President of the United States always says, when we fight, yeah. when we fight, yeah. when we fight, yeah. thank you. God bless. All right, Vice Presidential nominee Tim Walz there getting a rapturous reception at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Also, Coach Walz uh, leaning heavily into the sporting metaphors at the end there. Let's get back to Bloomberg Balance of Power co-anchor Joe Matthew. He's at the DNC in Chicago. So, Joe, we were speaking to you a little bit earlier. You were talking about how this was going to be a, a getting-to-know-you speech for many voters uh, when it comes to yep. learning more about Tim Walz. Uh, how did he do? Well, that's largely, I think, what we got there. In fact, short and sweet, uh, I'll have to admit, following some very long speeches uh, in the course of this Democratic National Convention and remembering that, you know, J.D. Vance spoke for the better part of 45 minutes at the RNC. Donald Trump spoke for an hour and a half. So keeping this short and sweet was part of the job at a convention that was kind of running long on the last couple of nights here. But it was punchy. It's a crowd that was warmed up by the likes of Bill Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, Governor Josh Shapiro, Pete Buttigieg. Fever pitch here before he even got out on the stage. And he used his time wisely tonight. Indeed, the sports metaphors were everywhere. As he said, we've got 76 days. Uh, and referring to uh, to football, the line was, it's the fourth quarter, we're down a field goal, but we're on offense, and we've got the ball. That's his message here, the pep talk, the coach talking to the team here, about to take the field. He made some promises, too. It sounded almost like what we would have heard from the Trump convention. Kamala Harris is going to cut your taxes, he said, is going to take on big pharma, is going to make things more affordable, and is going to stand up and fight for your freedom. As we hear Neil Young playing Tim Walls off the stage now, rocking in the free world. That's the message tonight in Chicago. 
And it's setting the stage for what we're going to get from Kamala. I mean, what are you expecting to hear from her? Well, look, that's the big speech tomorrow night. All of this has simply been a wind up to that moment, which will be the most important political speech of her career. She's going to be speaking to people who are still getting to know her, much like Tim Walls was. But this is the top of the ticket. And we're in a very interesting political moment here in America, having seen this race completely turned upside down about four weeks ago, following the attempted assassination of the Republican nominee, Donald Trump. So it's going to be an opportunity to stop the clock, essentially, to talk to the delegates in the room and people, more importantly, watching this from their living rooms, to get to the matter of trust on issues like the economy, like dealing with the border and some of the other issues that have dogged her in this campaign based on some of the polling that we've seen. Donald Trump is still out polling Kamala Harris on issues, specifically the economy and the border. But we'll hear about reproductive rights. We'll hear about her life story, remembering as well that she is still introducing herself or reintroducing herself to a lot of Americans who don't know the story of Kamala Harris. Yeah, Joe, are we going to get a bit more policy going forward? The, all of this has been very heavy on rhetoric so far from both sides. I mean, but we did have Tim yeah. Walls there mentioning the middle class tax cuts, as you say, uh, prescription prices, That's affordable right. homes. Are, are we perhaps going to see a pivot to a more substantive debate now? I wouldn't think until we leave Chicago, to be honest with you. This is party time here. This is a political rally. And the more specific these candidates get, uh, the more complex it can be to communicate with voters. This is about rallying the base here and introducing themselves to Americans who may not know their stories, talking to the independents who've not necessarily made up their mind. It's about seeking a tone, a vibe, as these Democrats here like to say, or unity was the word we kept hearing in Milwaukee. Then it turns into the sprint, and we head for the first debate on the 10th of September. That's when you're going to start hearing more details about policy, not to mention an interview, which she has still not done. Kamala Harris has not held a major news conference or sat down for a hard-hitting one-on-one interview uh, since she got into the, the phase of the campaign in which she's now the party's nominee. And she'll have to do that when she comes out of Chicago. But we'll be waiting to see if there's a bounce off the convention. We'll watch the polling and get ready for the road trip that will follow. Yeah, Joe, on that note, why hasn't that interview happened? What, what's the, why the delay? <laughs> Well, I think if you're Kamala Harris, she would ask you, why would I do it? I mean, she's seen a remarkable turn in the polls here, and she seems to have captured momentum. The people who are asking for news conferences and interviews are people like me and you. Voters are still getting to know them, and there's going to be in the next 76 days an opportunity to do that. She will have to, but I think the hope was to get through this convention, get through the messaging secure the nomination officially, and then get on to, to more specific details. That debate I mentioned on the 10th of September will be the line of demarcation on detailing policy to draw contrasts between these two campaigns. Uh, Joe, something else that stood out, I mean, just listening to Walls, was how he said if they take the time to craft, uh, you know, Project 2025, you know, it gives you the sense that they would go on to kind of enact it. How much do you think this kind of brings in voters who, you know, will have to push back against this, swing voters, undecided voters? Does that bring up that fear, Joe? Well, you know, to be clear, Project 2025 is something we heard a lot about this week, uh, and it's something that the Trump uh, campaign would prefer not to talk about. They've taken great lengths to try to distance themselves from the authors of that report, which came from, it was a policy paper that came from the Heritage Foundation, not from the Trump campaign. Now, to be clear, there are a lot of former Trump officials who are part of that. And the Heritage Foundation is very close to any Republican administration or campaign if it means taking the White House. So look, there's going to be some overlap there. I suspect we might find some areas uh, that the campaign does not embrace. But we just need to be clear that while this is a real hot potato right now in American politics, it's something Democrats want us to talk about, something that the Trump campaign does not want us to talk about. It's not an official proposal from Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. It may, however, resemble a lot, a lot of the things that they would like to do if they were reelected. All right, Balance of Power co-anchor Joe Matthew there at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Wrapping up uh, another long day three. Stay tuned for our live special coverage from the final night of the DNC. 
Vice President Kamala Harris going to be formally accepting the nomination as the Democratic candidate for president. You can see that so on the times that you see on the screen there. All right, let's uh, get back to the market's action in Asia. Avril, what are we watching? I think it's a bit of market inaction given how stocks have pulled back a bit more cautious now in the lead up to tomorrow where we're going to hear from Jay Powell at Jackson Hole as well as Governor Weda in Parliament and ahead of all that even though based on the Fed minutes sounding a bit dovish even though we got a bit of those concerns coming through in terms of the jobs revisions from the Bureau of Labor Statistics reinforcing the sense that we're going to get those Fed rate cuts. Look at where stocks are pretty much sideways across the board. Of course, noting what we're seeing in the Korean won, it's given up some of the gains that we've been seeing recently. Let's dig deeper into the markets with Mary Nicola. She's our M Life uh, strategist. So Mary, just looking at what we got out of the US and then, you know, leading up into tomorrow, what is your sense of how assured this Fed rate cut path is going to be. Yeah, the FOMC minutes gave it away in terms of saying that some members were actually looking for, were convinced of something to happen in July. So that gives way for September. And obviously, after we saw the labor market data, it opens the door for a September rate cut. And likely what we're going to get from Jay Powell is that is that he solidifies that, that September is going to commence the start of easing. Whether we get a jumbo rate cut is really going to depend on the labor market data and how bad the next one comes up. Um, otherwise, it looks like it will likely be of 25 basis points. Don't be surprised if he actually talks about, you know, data dependency. This is what we've heard from their G10 peers as well, is the fact that, yes, we're going to start cutting, but we're going to be cautious going forward. What about on that downward revision? from the preliminary data on jobs. How much of a concern is that for the jobs market? You know, it does. It shows that there are cracks in the labor market, and it's something that obviously is going to concern the Fed because if we if we step back, of course, we know that their dual mandate is price stability and the labor market. And of course, when you see more cracks in the labor market, more than what you thought, that poses some questions about how how much this how restrictive your policy needs to be. But again, inflation still remains above target. Next week's PCE is likely to show that, you know, PCE is still high. It's not going down to the 2% target that we're that the Fed would like to see it. And there are still pockets of of the of the activity data, especially on the consumer side, that is still showing strength. Um, so it's not like the Fed is completely out of the woods yet where they can start being more aggressive on their easing. What is that going to mean for Treasuries? I mean, a lot has already been priced in. Do we see a bit of a pullback between now and when we get the jobs report the week after next? I think so. I think you get a pullback from, uh, from we've had a really aggressive and good rally in U.S. Treasuries over the past few weeks as traders have been posing looking for increased bets. You know, at one point we thought that the, they were looking for a 50 basis point um, cut um, for September. Now they've paired that back to something around 30 basis points. But even then, if you're looking at the path thereafter, they're looking for quite aggressive cuts um, over the next year or so. That puts this, this, this into question, especially if Powell says, we're going to remain a little bit cautious. We're going to have to see how the data unfolds before we continue. Because remember, a lot of the Fed speakers have actually said the last thing we want is for the Fed to start cutting and then hike again. Yeah, they don't want to go forward and have to walk back some of these uh, cuts. Mary, thank you so much for weighing in. Really appreciate your insights. Bloomberg and Life Strategist Mary Nicola. Now, let's get a look at how Indian markets are faring as they're up and running. Uh, we're seeing, of course, today it is looking pretty risk off in the region, a bit more caution as the wait continues into what we get from Jay Powell as well as Weda. But stocks in India taking high. Higher. Look at the Nifty as well as the Sensex. A bit more green compared to what we see in the rest of the region. Play more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
initially when we started this business, uh, obviously the market has grown to be much more competitive since we started this business back in 2021. This is the first year we start delivering our cars and our initial expectations was not as high. We were expecting around 70 to 80,000 delivery for the entire 2024. Uh, but as you can see from our call last night, we've been talking about 100,000 to 120,000 units for this year, right? And obviously, uh, EV is still a, very much a scale business. If you have a bigger scale, you can amortize your fixed costs more efficiently, number one. Uh, so if once you have a, now that we have a bigger delivering target for this year. What our is fixed, that, sorry? Uh, the, the new delivery target? Uh, 100,000 to 120,000. Okay. So, um, so that, that allows us to amortize our fixed costs more efficiently, number one. Number two is, you know, and, and we mentioned that in our call last night as well, is the suppliers have been really, really good to us. Mm. They were able to work with us and offer us the best prices that is available in the market, mm. despite our scale was not as big as many of our peers. Uh, so that also helped us in terms of lowering our bomb cost. I think number three is also that when you look at our EV, you can see that we offered a lot of different fun stuff, right? We have different colors, we have different accessories that you can buy, and that office, they help us enhance our margins overall. When you talk about scaling the EV business, obviously it means a greater investment as well in, in factories or production facilities. Mm -hmm. Where are you looking to build those? Well, I think uh, we started our factory, uh, our first factory in Beijing right now. Mm. Uh, that has an annual capacity of core 200,000 units. Uh, we obviously are trying to scale that up and become more, more efficient. So if you look at our plans, we, we started double shift uh, beginning of mm. June. And then we have to make some changes to our productions during the course of July uh, that help us enhance the production capacity further. So if you look at our delivery right now, we are over 10,000 vehicles that we delivered per month in June and in July, most likely in August as well. So we've been able to scale our production facility as well as our delivery capabilities. Xiaomi Vice President and CFO Elaine Lam there speaking exclusively with our tech reporter Annabelle Drewlers after the company reported its fastest pace of revenue growth since 2021. Shares responding pretty well, better by 8% right now. Let's get some more from Annabelle. Bell, that's a pretty crowded uh, space, the EV market in China. Can this, this sort of momentum be uh, maintained by Xiaomi? Well, it certainly seems possible, at least that's the, the indication that the company is giving here. I mean, Xiaomi has come into this from a bit of a different perspective. It's not exactly a, a new entrant in the space, uh, given that it already has very established capabilities, supply chains in IoT devices, in smartphones as well. And so it's using those lessons, those management skills, those supply chain capabilities, and applying them to the EV space as well. Importantly, it's it's been able to get some very competitive uh, selling costs as well from its bigger suppliers. What's interesting to note and why we're really seeing this big share price action today comes down to the margins because we saw strong margins across the business. The EV sector in particular, 15.4%. Uh, the company is saying that's going to continue or improve toward the year end. So certainly a, a good start for Xiaomi as perhaps uh, a major EV player. They're looking to become uh, worldwide top five. Uh, in the next two decades. All right, tech reporter Annabelle Drill is there. And that is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia. Horizons Middle East and Africa up next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>